In just a few months, ChatGPT is the fastest growing web platform ever, faster than TikTok or Instagram. My final guest is Margaret Mitchell, the chief ethics scientist at the AI company Hugging Face. She was also an AI researcher at Microsoft and Google. Welcome, Margaret. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Chris, thank you. Um, to start, have you been surprised at all by the seemingly explosive growth of ChatGPT and this uh, you know, generative AI innovations since the fall? Um, I haven't been surprised that people got really excited about it. The amount of excitement uh, exceeded my expectations. Um, because the technology isn't something that is a fundamental improvement over where we've been for the past year or so. Um, that said, the fact that the general public can now use this technology um, made it clear that this would be something that people found exciting. Um, so it's not surprising, but the amount of excitement is somewhat surprising. Yeah, I, I think there's been a lot of discussion in terms of the rollout of ChatGPT, and now we have rival products that are on the market that Google's introducing, as well as both companies uh, saying that they're going to be using uh, AI-powered search engines more and more. Uh, do you think that sort of arms race, as it's being described, is concerning at all in terms of products hitting the market before they're ready, and are, is that posing any concerns? Yeah. Yeah, well, the frame of arms race is already problematic because it it puts into light a sort of warlike and belligerent approach to developing technology, which I think is already sort of a problematic perspective. Um, but beyond that, the kind of things that this technology is useful for um, are creative uses, helping experts expand on things, um, really being assistive and augmentative if you already know about something, um, or helping you be creative in storytelling and this kind of thing. Um, using it for facts and things like search uh, is the exact opposite of how it should be used, sort of. Uh, you know, you can do sort of fact-based work or non-fact-based work uh, with this technology, and it's great at non-fact-based work. Um, so the fact that there's been this sudden urge to implement this technology in, in search seems um, like trying to just uh, use it sort of as, as this hammer that you have, and you have this you know, you're already a tech company and you use search and so you'll put it in there, but um, it doesn't actually make a lot of sense for that purpose. Yeah. What are some of those risks that you see this technology posing, especially for an everyday user who's playing around on it? What should they be aware of in terms of what this technology poses? Yeah, so I think your previous guests already covered a lot of this too, um, but Basically, if you understand that it is very good at saying things that sound plausible but aren't correct, um, then it's a little bit easier to work with it, but it can be very persuasive. And so even when you come in and intellectually knowing that it tends to make things up, it's still uh, there's still sort of a bias we have. It's called automation bias, where we tend to believe things that come out of a machine sounding factual. Um, so it's a real issue that uh, we'll perceive factuality when it's so good at sounding like it is facts, uh, but it's not. Um, so that's one big issue. Um, another issue is that it can be sort of persuasive. Um, so I think some of the uh, conversations that have been coming out over the past few days uh, that people have been seeing, uh, you kind of get a sense how you can really be persuaded by the um, the kinds of things it's trying to get you to do or want you to do. There's the New York Times piece out today where Kevin Roos is talking about um, how uh, the Bing chat is trying to get him to leave his wife and things. Um, and so you can imagine that people who maybe have less of a grip on reality or who are very easily persuaded uh, might be persuaded to do um, things that are really problematic. It's, it's a big concern I have. Um, so this is where concerns around extremism um, come in and uh, sort of feeling like um, empowered to do problematic things that can hurt people. Um, so that's another really big issue. Um, and then, of course, there's also the sort of biases. Who gets mentioned and who gets not? Who gets associated to their accomplishments and who gets associated to what they look like, right? And these 
and these are known uh, to reflect gender biases, racial biases, all these societal biases that we already have reflected in the data and that the system picks up. Um, so you really have to work with it with a grain of salt, and that can be really hard to do when it seems so convincing. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think it's important for lawmakers and regulators to get out in front of this issue? It seems like up until now there's been federal guidelines that are voluntary for companies to follow if they choose to. And, um, you know, at this point, it seems like tech companies are sort of setting those rules for themselves. Uh, do you think that we can trust the tech companies to do so? Or do you think that lawmakers really have to get on top of this? I would love for lawmakers to get on top of this. Um, and I can speak to the kinds of things that would be particularly useful. I think that um, some tech companies have demonstrated that they're not capable of any sort of self-regulation in this environment. Um, so for example, you need to demonstrate that you're able to do due diligence on a technology. So looking into what are the harms and risks in addition to the benefits. Um, and that has largely been work that technology companies have tried to bury. Um, this is something that affected me very personally in my career. Um, and so we've already very clearly seen that, tech, that technology companies can't really self-regulate this and actually fight against um, even some of the basics of doing it. Um, so it would be super useful if lawmakers uh, could do something sort of proactive here. There's a few uh, basic things that one can do. So. Um, one is around uh, system performance, so actually reporting how the system works in different situations. Uh, I worked on this thing called model cards, which is basically documentation. Um, so you can think about how crazy it is that these kinds of models and systems are released without any real documentation about how well they work and in what situations they work. Uh, we sort of have documentation for lots of other things. We have nutrition, nutrition facts for food. You know, it's so strange that such powerful technology doesn't even have the basics of documentation. Uh, so that's one thing, uh, documentation that would include evaluation of how it works in different domains and with different kinds of subpopulations. So who tends to get mentioned and who doesn't? Is it erasing black women, for example? How is it uh, interacting with people from different subpopulations? Is it giving a just and you know pleasant or good experience across the board? Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is around data. Um, and I would really, really love to see more work coming out of the U.S. in particular on data and data governance. Um, so these systems are learning from other people's data. So you and me, we write on the web. Maybe this transcript is on the web. And that's sort of fair game uh, for these systems to learn from. Um, but actually, you might make the argument that uh, the transcript of this should be owned by the Hill. Um, and that you should be compensated for this interview if um, if Microsoft is going to be making money off of it. Um, and similar for artists, similar for writers. Um, uh, there are like news articles behind paywalls that the system can just scrape and then provide as summaries. Um, and that also means that um, if it's providing summaries, then people aren't clicking through to the websites to actually go to them. And if that website relies on ad revenue, um, now they're not making any money either. Um, so it's really important to pay attention to how the data is being sourced. Um, and there are three main things that I think is useful to drive this. The three Cs, uh, consent, compensation, and credit. So people want to be attributed for their work. People should be compensated for their work. Um, and they should be able to consent to whether or not the things they put out online can or cannot be used in this technology. So I would love to see regulators take a really serious look at how this data is working and what can be done to um, put some rights back in the, in the hands of the people actually creating the data. Yeah, do you think that there's any concerns that this poses heading into another election in 2024 or local elections before that in terms of how bad actors can maybe use yeah. artificial intelligence for that? Do you want to speak about that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I'm already worried about that from previous elections. You know, there are already sort of bots on social media influencing people and uh, creating this illusion that there are a lot of like-minded people um, who were, you know, 
um, pro-Trump or, you know, whatever it was in the U.S. election, um, when a lot of them were just sort of synthetic. Um, and so now that the technology is even better, you can imagine this proliferating all over the place. Um, so these sort of bots all over social media, um, you know, the different kinds of things that we use, uh, like Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, whatever the kids are using these days, um, in order to, to try and influence people to think that things are... Um, that things happened that didn't happen. So the sort of fake news idea. Um, there's also now the ability to generate realistic looking images. So not only can this um, kind of generative technology be used to generate um, uh, false information, misinformation, uh, but also be used to generate pictures and videos uh, that go alongside it. Uh, so now you can't even really trust what you can see or read online, right, about um, the sort of things going on relative to politics. Um, and so I'm, I'm really concerned about um, sort of bot armies that proliferate, that create misinformation alongside synthetic videos that tie, um, that tie politicians to things that didn't happen, but really rile up people um, and uh, encourage them towards more extremist views. Um, it's, we, sh we should be preparing for this right now. It's like already happening. So <laughs> the chop chop world. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And that brings us to the end of our program. Thanks again to Margaret Mitchell and to all of our guests today. Thanks to all of you for watching. For those of you who missed any of the conversations this afternoon, we'll have video from the event up on our website shortly. I'm Rebecca Clark, hope you enjoyed the program and have a great rest of your day.